This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. You know, in our last session, we dealt with the kingdom staff of authority. And authority can open doors, authority can close doors. And we've discovered that the staff that Adam had, he didn't use right. That in his immaturity or whatever the case may be, he chose not to use his staff to protect the garden and to protect Eve. And so selfishness can cause authority to be misused and abused. And my, haven't we seen that? And especially when you look at uh, communistic countries, totalitarian states, that uh, authority is constantly abused. And uh, some of the worst things have been done by those that have abused authority. And so how do we learn to move correctly in authority and move in the kingdom? And really the word's quite clear that love is the key to moving in kingdom authority. If I'm going to take up the staff of Messiah in my life and in the, for the lives of those around me, I cannot succumb to the same temptations that Adam did in the garden. Rather, I look to Jesus to show me how to move and love the proper way. And so I'm going to be dealing about love, and really I could do a, a lot of different scriptures uh, because they're, they're all over Old Testament and New Testament. But I want to start with a very familiar one today. John 3.16. Any Baptist worth his salt knows this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We need to understand that the first time that Jesus came it was a mission out of love as Messiah ben Joseph. He came to suffer in our place. He came to take on that which we could not bear, but yet it was not something that he did. It was something that we did that was beyond comprehension. Man betrayed Almighty God in the garden, committed high treason. And yet when God showed up, he said, now listen, there are repercussions for what you have done. How many know that? That's a truth that we need to learn, and there's an entire generation needs to learn that sometimes I'm sorry isn't enough because you set things in motion, especially the older you get. There are things that you set in motion. You can say, I'm sorry all day long, but the ripple effect of what you have done can continue through much of your life. And so Adam and Eve could say, I'm sorry, all day long, and it, 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 wasn't, it didn't suffice. 
that situation, although Adam went far from it, he said, yeah, as this woman you gave me was the problem. I mean, throwing people under the bus, you know. Guys, here's a good tip for you. When you get caught doing something wrong, never throw your woman under the bus. Okay, learn from Adam. But in the midst of, you see, grace didn't start in the New Testament. Grace didn't even start with Noah. People say, you know, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. That's where grace started. Grace started when God showed up after Adam and Eve had sinned. He said, listen, there's repercussions for what you have done, but I'm going to send somebody to fix this, the seed of the woman. And one day a virgin would conceive and bear a son, and his name would be called Yeshua, salvation. And that he would give his life for us. That grace, that seed of grace was planted in Genesis 3. And it took thousands of years for that word to become flesh. Well, you say, Mike, why do you say thousand? Because there may be a discrepancy in the Masoretic text. We're finding, I'm getting ready to, view, uh, to interview Doug Woodward, that the King James says there's 4,000 years, but it may have been closer to almost 5,600 years because the Rabbi Kiba altered the Hebrew text to skew away from Messiah in the second century and then actively worked to destroy all of the manuscripts that predate the Masoretic text. But we have the Dead Sea Scrolls and we have the Septuagint. And what's interesting is the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls, its timeline matches, but the Masoretic text does not. But God said, I'm going to set something in motion. I'm going to redeem you. You see, love doesn't think of itself, it thinks of others. And the greatest way that authority is wield is when you put others first. Not yourself. For God so loved that he was willing, and this word love, agape, is it, it, such a fascinating word in the Greek because even the Greek gods didn't have agape. It was this type of love that was beyond comprehension, even above the Greek gods that were petty and jealous, and they had all the same flaws that humanity had. They just had a lot of power. But yet, but yet instinctively, man knew that there was a love. It literally means to be breathless, kind of like that guy on your first date. Or maybe watching your fiance go down the aisle getting ready to be your bride. I remember when Mary and I got married, I was breathless and I was working hard not to pass out. Because there's breathless anticipation that God so breathlessly loved humanity and he wanted to undo what the Nachash did in the garden that he sent his only son to take our place on the cross. Love caused him to bear that. Love causes Jesus to want to see us walk in what he came to give us fully. We don't have to beg him for it. It's just lining ourselves up with the kingdom so that it can begin working correctly. I want to show you the price he paid. Isaiah 53, starting in verse 3. You see, so many people look at Jesus on the cross and they say, I see a wimp, I see, I see someone despisable, I see... The, and what we don't realize, that in Gethsemane, when he had to pray, Lord, your will, not mine, be done, was because he began to already bear our sinful nature, even in the garden before he got to the cross. And so we see this broken human being. Flavius Josephus said that his body itself was reduced to raw hamburger, if you will. To human rubble, to quote Josephus correctly. The modern vernacular would be hamburger. We do not see Jesus on the cross. We see what he bore from us on the cross. We see the brokenness. 
We see the horror of what sin does in somebody's life on that cross. Isaiah tells us he is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. You know that the rabbis still teach today that Jesus deserved what he got on the cross. No, no, no. We deserved it. Love, by the love, that expression of love that he did, he was able to take the fallen staff of Adam and turn it into the cross and then bore everything that Adam released into humanity on that cross for us. It was love. We need to understand that the nails did not hold him to the cross. His love for us did. You know, I, I can imagine, the, he said, you know, I could have asked for legions of angels to come and deliver me. And I wonder if the angels weren't ready to be released. If the Father would have said a word, the earth would no longer exist. Love caused the Father to say nothing. Love caused Jesus not to call for them. Love held him to that cross until he said, it's finished. I got it done. I've made the way. That's the perfect expression of love. Isaiah goes on. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Jesus paid it all. Everything that came because of sin. Jesus bore it all. And it was because of love. But I want to read on in Matthew chapter 27. This is at the moment that Jesus surrenders and gives up the ghost. How many know that his life wasn't taken from him? He could have resurrected right there on the cross and wiped out the Roman army and wiped out everything in Jerusalem. But he gave up the ghost because he had another mission. He was going to go down to hell and whoop up on the devil for, th for a little bit and then go preach what he had done to those in Abraham's bosom. But I want you to see how the earth responded to what the Creator was going through. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. And I heard one Greek professor say that if it hadn't been for the love of God, the earth would have tore itself apart at that moment. In fact, one of the hardest substances known to man as far as what is produced naturally is the diamond. And you know how hard it is to find a diamond without a crack in it? At the molecular level, creation begin to crack. Because the Creator was giving His life. And it says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after His resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. A lot of people stop right there. And I think it's kind of interesting, Uncle Harvey, that you had buried about a year before in Abraham's bosom. After the resurrection of Jesus... Hey, Junior, how's it going? IV. <laughs> John G. Lake, in his, in, uh, when he was alive, he actually was able to ferret out some documents, paid a big price for it from a testimony 
of a family that had a loved one that came back and knocked on their door that had been dead for several years that resurrected when Jesus resurrected. And they walked around Jerusalem for a while. You want to talk about trying to do a cover-up. And the testimony of how that they begin to hear screams and all this torment and turmoil going on in Sheol and how that the glorious victorious one came across the chasm that no one could come across and begin to declare that he was Messiah and declare to them what he had done for them. And then when he resurrected, he cleared the place out. To this day, Abraham's bosom is empty. To be absent from the body is to be with the Lord. There is no such thing as soul sleep. We look at a Jewish colloquialism in the first century. They said they sleep. And that was just the nice way. You know, when we're, we're in, in, in America, we say they kick the bucket, don't we? You go to Mexico and you say, Uncle Henry kicked the bucket. Everybody's worried about what was in the bucket and if it was, and if it was worth enough for you to tell him that he kicked the bucket because when you're in Mexico, they stretch out their legs. You see, there, there, are, there are sayings within each culture that represent that. Uh, recently in an interview with Josh Peck, Dr. Michael Heiser said that within all the Semitic languages and all the cultures within the Middle East, there was not one single expression of soul sleep. Just like there wasn't before the cross, they were in Abraham's bosom. The minute you die, you either go up or you go down. Your body may be resting in the grave, but how many know that body is not you? No more than my coat, if I was wearing a suit coat and I took it off and let it set in the chair, that coat, you may know that that's Mike Lake's coat, that's the coat that he always wears. I identify him with that coat, but Mike Lake's not in the coat if it's sitting on the chair. This is my earth suit. And it matches my spirit man. Its DNA matches harm, harmonically at the quantum level with who that I am. But one day I'm going to leave it. Then God's going to resurrect it. And that resonance is going to match my spirit. And I'm going to come back into it in a glorified body. It's called the resurrection. Hoo-hoo. Some of the, I mean, some of the things to describe what the Word says, and it's not about, you know, how many know there are a lot of bodies that aren't in the graves and they've been turned into soil and over the years? And so the argument is there can't be a resurrection because there's not enough soil on the planet. The resurrection is a, is a creative force. That there's your DNA in heaven and God uses it as a template to create the perfect body for you so that you can come back into. So there is a supernatural creation with the resurrection. So there's going to be people that jump out of the ocean that their bodies were long a part of fish food and everything else at the bottom of the ocean, but it doesn't matter. They're coming out when Jesus says, now's the time. Just wanted to throw that out. That's not in my notes. I'm not going to charge extra for that today. But I want you to see verse 45 because there's prophetic unction in, or 54, this next verse. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this is the Son of God. Do you know that's, that is a prophetic image? That when the Gentiles were preached the gospel, what would be their response? Truly, this is the Son of God. How many know prior to Cornelius' home, we had some believers right here? Especially when that centurion was most likely in the know that three days later, that tomb was emptied and it wasn't because the guards were asleep, it was because the power that exerted out of that tomb, they couldn't stop. It's a foreshadow of the Gentiles coming into salvation. But how is the love of God expressed after we're saved? How many know God loves you? Wants to meet your needs? I mean, there's a lot of things He wants to do. 
And we have, we have people in hyper grace that it's just, it's just all unicorns and, and gold dust that the unicorn snorts out its nose and everything is just going to be wonderful, peachy, great, and God's just going to blow you kisses and that's, going to, and that's, and that's how you show love. Remember there's something called tough love. Any parent ever, ever had to give tough love? That's when the mom or dad said, you know what, I brought you into this world, I can take you out, you know, you have those moments. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 7. People always ask me, I, 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 I don't know if I'm saved or not. Well, did you, did you give your life to Jesus? Yes, but I don't know if I'm saved or not. There are times in a believer's life that they will wrestle with this. This, I think, can help solve that question. Starting in verse 7, if you endure chastisement, God deals with you, with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten or correct? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. You know, we need to have a sila moment there. If the Holy Ghost is convicting you of sin and correcting you, and the Word of God is correcting you as you mature, it's proof of your sonship. For those that are marching around and it's all hyper grace and God never corrects me because there's no such thing as sin anymore, by the definition of the Word of God, you are not His child. How many know parents do not correct their children because they hate them? It's because they love them and they're trying to say, when you get older, there are consequences for what you do. And I would rather you learn it now when the only consequence is going to be a sweat, you know, a swat on the seat of learning than to have something cascade that you're going to be affected the rest of your life by. It's never pleasurable for an adult to correct the child. In fact, it's hard many, many times. But you know that if they don't learn, it's going to begin opening the door to worst things in their lives. And yet what we see, we see generations that are not corrected by their parents because that's no longer permissible. We had a guy back in the 60s named Dr. Spock who came up with child psychology, someone who was never married as far as I have been able to do my research, never had children, and yet his book became the premise for the lawlessness that we see today because children are never taught, they're never corrected, therefore in their own minds and the way they have been brought up, there are no ramifications for what they do. That's why they can't connect with the gospel. Well, if dad loves me, then, it, then, while I, then he's going to have to love me as I am. And, and when I have a, a pouty fit, he's just going to have to give in because, the, because he loves me. I'm the baby, got to love me. Well, one of the most horrible things in the world is a 40-year-old baby. The correction of God is because he said, listen, if I don't nip this in the bud now, and you continue down this track, I can see where you're headed, and it's not good. And because I love you, I'm convicting of you of sin. I'm trying to show you from my word all those scriptures that you don't like. All the thou shalt nots. <laughs> he don't love me because he told me not to. One of them, what if one of them was, thou shalt not jump off a cliff? Because so many times we're in situations that we are emotionally jumping off a cliff with no parachute. We are setting things in motion that God is saying, listen, you're going to regret it the rest of your life. David himself said, Lord, forgive me of the sins of my youth because he saw what some of the sins of his youth, what those things set in motion that he saw he paid for the rest of his life. 
You see, I, I would like for all of us, when you get my age, you look back, and there's some things that just kind of make you cringe. It's like, oh I, wish, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Wish I hadn't said that. Mary and I don't know how many times we said, boy, if we knew what we know now, we knew it back then, boy, what a different life we'd have had. But how many know you can't go back in time? You can't, I mean, linear time is one way. This way, we can't go back this way to undo what we've done. But if we listen to God because of His love for us and His authority in our life, if we would have listened to the gentle leading of the Holy Spirit, we need to learn lives in such a way that God doesn't have to shout. We need to learn from Elijah that sometimes he speaks in the quietness. Not in the whirlwind, but in the quietness. Those are times of comfort. We don't need to join Peter's club of the head of sore hair when he walked out on the water, began looking to things around him, and Jesus had to grab him up by the hair to keep him from drowning. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gather to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the Son of Perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand the Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.